record. And then I will, okay. So Father Vaughn, as soon as you're ready, I'll throw it over to you. Thank you so much. Excellent, you're welcome. And just a note with Ash Wednesday, which um, Adam mentioned is, is February 17th, you're gonna be hopefully receiving a, a, a letter soon. We're gonna hopefully going out this week, which has information about that. We do have Ash Wednesday Masses at 8 a.m., 10 a.m., and then 7 p.m. And we realize people may want to come to receive ashes, but not come for the whole Mass. And so uh, as such, we will be available for to give out, to distribute ashes immediately after each of the Masses. So if you're looking and saying, well, I, I, I don't want to come into the church for a whole hour, but I do still want to receive my ashes. So we'll be doing that at 9 a.m., at 11 a.m., and then at 8, 8 p.m., so right after each of the um, Ash Wednesday Masses. So today we're talking about Jesus teaches us to pray a closer look at the Our Father. Let's share my screen. There, can you all see that? Good. All right. I don't know if you can or not. I'm just saying good anyways. But... Uh, going to read the context of the Our Father in for our opening prayer uh, as it is in the sacred scriptures. So we're reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites who love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on street corners so that others may see them. Amen. I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go to your inner room, close the door, and pray to your Father in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will repay you. In praying, do not babble like the pagans who think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. Your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This is how you are to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not subject us to the final test, but deliver us from the evil one. If you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your transgressions. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have taught us to call God Father. We ask, Lord, that you allow us to enter more deeply into relationship with you and with the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, here we are all together in the snow and all of that stuff, even though you can't see the snow in the background of my little picture. Um, and I just want to remind us what it's all about. Um, the whole heart of our faith is about what God has done for us, his salvation. And I, I refer to this as the deep yogurt of sin and death. It's all about salvation. And so when we look at that, God, we, we look at how God created and what did God create? That was not supposed to happen. He, I thought I had this fixed. Anyways, he created us. But we're sad because we're separated by, from God from the, by the deep yogurt of sin and death. But God, who sent Jesus, who is God, into our, uh, into our humanity, he walked our walk, he talked our talk, he lived our life, and he died our death then rose to new and everlasting life with the Father, destroying the eternal consequences of sin and death, and so turning our frowns upside down, that we have to share in this very life. You see, this is something, and, and I spoke about this in my homily this weekend, this is so key that God made us he made us for love. We have a purpose. And unlike the way the world sees the world, the, unlike the way the culture sees the world, we're not just a bunch of random atoms. That's A-T-O-M-S, not Adam Casters. 
but random atoms. I know, I know I'm a father. It means I have dad humor, but we're a bunch of, we're not just a bunch of atoms that happen to smash into each other over the course of millennia and eons. And so then we just happen to be. No, God made us with a purpose. He made us by love. He made us for love. He made us to love. We're called to love one another and to receive the love of Almighty God. And so God comes into our humanity to be able to break us from this de deep yogurt of sin and death, sorry, deep yogurt of sin and death over here in order to give us new life, to redeem us and to bring us into heaven with God. And then we get immersed in the mystery of this mystery here by the fact that we go through, um, through the sacraments. We enter into this mystery through uh, baptism. We are immersed more fully and receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior every time we go to communion. We receive his forgiveness in the sacrament of reconciliation. So we have all that. This is all important because the most important thing is remembering we're in relationship with Almighty God. And that's what prayer is. So we'll get to that in a little bit. But I wanted to look just a little bit about the context of what's going on. When Jesus gives the Our Father, we can hear about it in Matthew and in Luke. And in the Gospel of Matthew, we hear about it in what's called the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus speaks um, for several chapters about all sorts of different teachings and becoming the new Moses, as it were. Um, and this particular part is in the context of fasting, almsgiving, and prayer. And then after that, after the Our Father, he talks about trust in the Lord, about how we're called not to um, worry about this moment and this or, or, or the future and, you know, making sure we have enough clothes and food and all these things. He says, your Father in heaven knows what you need before you ask him. So in the Gospel of Matthew, it's in the context of looking to God in relationship. In the Gospel of Luke Jesus gives the Our Father, it's right before it is when Martha and Mary happen. You know that story where Jesus goes to visit Martha and Mary, and uh, Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet, and Martha is busy about doing all sorts of things. But then she complains to the Lord, Jesus, tell Mary to come and help me. She tells God what to do. Really, we shouldn't do that. But she tells God what to do. And Jesus says, you're, you're anxious about many things, but only one thing is necessary. And Mary has chosen the better part. We're not taking it from her. So that coming into relationship with Jesus, being one with him, resting at his feet, listening to him teach. And then the next thing we see, we see Jesus, he's praying. And the disciples look at him and like, they're inc incredibly overwhelmed by Jesus's prayer. And they say, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples, teach us how to pray. And so Jesus says, when you pray, say, Father. And then after this, the, the parable after that in Luke is about um, persevering in prayer, where Jesus tells the parable about, you know, if you have a friend that comes at midnight, even if asking for a loaf of bread, even if you don't give it to him because of friendship, you're going to give it to him because he's persevering. So we look and we say, this, this is the context which Jesus gives us this incredible prayer of the Our Father. Now, uh, when we look at this, we see in all of this, God's providential care for us. He takes care of us. He loves us. He wants us to know that incredible love. And you see, the problem is uh, it's all started in Genesis, where it starts where Adam and Eve were trusting God. They were walking with him in the garden, but then, but then it all fell apart. God created Adam in love, and then Eve in that pa paradise where they had everything they needed. But then the serpent enters in. Now, the serpent was made was more subtle than any of the other wild creatures that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say, you shall not eat of any of the trees of the garden? So what's going on here? He's creating doubt in God's providential love and care. Now, what does providential mean? Providence means God provides for us. He provides what we need. 
He's creating doubt in the heart of the woman. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die. God's a liar is what he's saying. You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave to some to her husband, and he ate. They stopped trusting God's love. Now, why am I bringing this up? This is so important because this is the whole heart and center of everything that's wrong with the world today, that we've stopped trusting God's love. Now, Jesus came, he walked our walk, he talked our talk, he lived our life, he died our death, and rose to new and everlasting life to pull us out of the deep yogurt of sin and death so that we could then get back and see how much God loves us. He goes to the cross so that we can trust in his love. So the story of the Garden of Eden is about God's love and care for us, but how we doubted his love and so rejected us. So what is Christian prayer? How do we enter into Christian prayer? What does it look like? Well, let's first look at what Christian prayer is not, because that's important. So this is revealed throughout the centuries, uh, specifically in the Our Father. But what is Christ what Christian prayer is not? It's not Eastern meditation. A lot of things with Eastern meditation is we spend time, what I would call blanking our minds, where we just focus on one thing and try to get all the thoughts out of our mind. That's not Christian prayer. Christian prayer is about not taking things out of our mind, but rather putting that one thing necessary in our mind. It's not about communi communicating information to God. Uh, you know, I think about um, some of the ways that they portray people who are awkward at prayer in TV and movies. I think about uh, the movie Evan Almighty, where he's now taken on this job uh, in Congress, and he goes and kneels by his bed at one point, and he's praying, and he says, talking to God, trying to give him information about what he needs. It's like, uh, and it's just so awkward that a lot of times we think we have to communicate to God what our needs are. We don't need to communicate information to God. As Jesus said, your father in heaven knows what you need before you ask him. That doesn't mean that we don't ask him. It's important to ask him, but it's not because he doesn't know. We don't need to inform him because he is unsure about what's going on. It's not about, Christian prayer is not about babbling words. Okay. I don't know if you've ever gone any place where people are praying the rosary together, and it sounds something like, We don't even get to the end, and the, we're just trying to get through it. Okay, if I just say all the right words and say them enough, then God has to hear me. Uh, we have these people that put out these, the un, the, this, this is the perfect novena that never gets, uh, never, never misses. It always gets what you want. No, it's not about saying the right words. It's not about babbling. Christian prayer is about relationship. It's about relationship with our daddy, with our God and father who loves us so much. Christian prayer is about relationship with Jesus, our brother, our savior, who loves us so passionately that he would die on the cross for you and for me. It's about intimacy with the Holy Spirit, who has come by our baptisms deep within our souls and our bodies and resides within us, and is calling us to become spouse to Almighty God. It's about relationship. It's about entering in and living that relationship. Christian prayer involves the whole person, both body and soul. 
very often we, we pray kneeling or we might stand. I think about the nine ways of prayer of St. Uh, Dominic. Um, we had to study him in one of my electives in, in seminary. And he had these nine different ways. And sometimes it was about him standing up and then throwing himself on his feet. Sometimes he was kneeling. Sometimes he would just stand in silent prayer, looking up to heaven. But, but there's something about our bodies that are so united to our souls that our bodies are involved. You know, and what is praying the rose, we, we might have, have beads in our hands. Or, or the sacraments, as we have bread and wine, we, we have oil, we have smells and bells. We have all sorts of different things to help bring our bodies and our minds into this prayer that is not just about our minds, though it is, of course, important to have our minds involved, but it's spirit and truth. We use our whole being to enter into this prayer. And so we're called uh, in body to think about, you know, what is the proper context that my body's in? So, for instance, you know, some people say that, you know, they struggle with prayer. And I, Say, okay, well, why is that? Well, you know, I, 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 I pray at the end of the day. Okay, that's good. It's not a bad thing to do. And, you know, uh, I never seem to be able to get through my prayers. Well, why not? Well, you know, I'm lying on my bed and I usually fall asleep. Well, duh, of course. Not that it's bad to, to pray when we're on our beds and getting ready for sleep. You know, the rosary is a great way to fall asleep if you've already prayed the rosary before. But um, if we're expecting to be able to enter into prayer, laying down on the bed is not a good way to do it because prayer can be very relaxing and it can also then put us to sleep. And so we don't enter into the fullness of prayer. So I think it's important to look at how where our bodies are. It could be sitting, could be standing, could be kneeling, could be moving in different ways. But what position is our body in? Because that makes a difference to how we're able to focus. And it's our body and our souls that we're not just thinking about, you know, trying to blank our minds, but rather we're thinking about God and him and his love and giving ourselves to him. So it involved, Christian prayer in our relationship involves the whole body and soul. It's about not communicating information, but communicating with someone, our daddy, just talking with him, just being with him, letting him hold us. You know, a lot of times uh, we, our children come to us, right? And they want to talk to us about all manner of stuff until they become teenagers. And then you ask them, how is school good? But um, at least when they're younger, they, they share all sorts of stuff that's going on in their lives. Sometimes they, they go on and on and on because they're comfortable with you, because they love you. You're their mom, they're their dad. They wanna share the good things of their life with you. And, dad, and God, our daddy, our Abba, our father, loves us so much. And he just loves it when we go to him and share what's going on with our day. Not that he doesn't know what's going on in our day. Of course he knows, he's God, but he loves it that we share. You see, prayer is about intimacy. Intimacy, the short definition of intimacy is into me see, where we allow God to see into us. We become vulnerable enough, we trust him enough to let him see into our hearts, our souls, our minds, the things that are going on in our lives, the struggles we have. So it's about communicating with our daddy and it's an act of love. That's what it is. Prayer doesn't necessarily even have to be saying anything. It's just being with God because we love him. You know, I think about um, couples who have been married for many years. They can be sitting on the couch, just holding each other, holding hands. And a squeeze of the hand can communicate so much without having any words. One of my friends likes to say that, you know, he can be sitting on the couch with his wife and he'll squeeze her hand and she knows what that means. He's saying, would you get up and make me a sandwich? And she squeezes his hand back and says, get your own sandwich. <laughs> but uh, all humor aside, there's, 
nonverbal communication, just being able to be with the person. So when we look at Christian prayer, there are three kind of main forms of prayer. There's vocal prayer, there's meditation, and there's contemplation. So what are these things? Vocal prayer can be external, where we're actually speaking out loud, but it can also be internal. It's not necessarily saying something out loud with our voice, but they can be the rote prayers that we know, the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the other things like that, our, our act of contrition. But they can also be uh, prayers of praise, where we're praising Almighty God, thanksgiving for all that he's doing, petition, asking him for specific things, or contrition, recognizing our sinfulness and asking God for sorrow. They can also be um, our, just a personal conversation with God. It doesn't have to be something that's written out, but just us talking with God and saying, God, here's my life. I'm struggling. I need your help can just be that. So that's the vocal prayer um, is, you know, speaking out loud or in our minds, whether rote prayers or other things. Meditation, uh, Christian meditation is about going with God and delving into the mystery of God. And it's through active thinking. It's not about blanking our minds. It's about active thinking about the different aspects of God's God, who he is, about his love, or about maybe taking a scripture passage and really delving into it through what we call Lexio Divina, divine reading, really praying through the scriptures, or through some other spiritual reading, but that maybe it's that we have an icon or some picture that we're just, we're gazing upon and thinking about what does this mystery mean for me and Almighty God, but it's something, it's an active thought process, and then contemplation literally means gazing, that we gaze upon the mystery of God. And as we grow in prayer, we move through all three of these things. Not like when we're young, we do vocal prayer. When we're older, we do meditation. When we're oldest, we do contemplation. And most, when we're most mature in the spiritual life. No, we use all three. We go back and forth between all of them. Because, well, we can't maintain contemplation for forever. Then we have to go back to meditation. And sometimes in vocal prayer, where does this meditation lead us? What has, what has come up in this prayer, in this meditation that we've viewed on? God, help me to be able to bring this into my life. So all three of these. Now there is a fourth type of prayer in Christian prayer called mystical contemplation, where God comes and he takes us out of ourselves. It's he who is doing it. We can't put it on. We can't do it in ourselves, but that's really a, a mystical gift that God is doing as opposed to vocal, vocal prayer, meditation, and contemplation, which is about us working with God to then come into contact with God. Okay, so where does the Our Father fit in all this? Oh, we're finally getting to the Our Father, Father. Um, where does the Our Father fit into this vocal prayer or meditation or contemplation? Well, in all of them. We start with vocal prayer, but we can be meditating on the mystery of who God is, because we want our mind to be thinking about who it is that we're speaking to and what it is that we're saying. And then contemplation as we gaze upon the mystery of who God is as Father, and that he's providing for us and all these things. So it, we're going to get into the Our Father now, and what does this look like? But uh, it's important, I would say, as much as we want prayer to be spontaneous, it's also good to memorize the prayer. And I think it's very important that uh, you teach your children how to pray the Our Father so that they know it deep within their hearts if, if they don't know it already. I think about my mother. She grew up in the time of using the Baltimore Catechism. For those of you who don't know what the Baltimore Catechism was, it was a way of teaching our children about the faith. And it was, they had to memorize questions and answers. Question, who made me? Answer, God made me. Question, why did God make me? Answer, God made me to know him, to love him, and to serve him in this life, excuse me, so that I can be with him forever in the next. So they had to memorize these things. The way my mother speaks about it, she said, when I was growing up, you know, it was just an active way of memorizing. It, we had tests and we had to be able to say, what's the third question? They'd have to be able to say the third question and then the third answer. And so it wasn't very much. But as she grew in, in her faith, as she matured in her faith, she said, those answer, those questions and answers 
really, they became so alive for me. They meant so much. So while the, we don't want to just start at uh, memorization, memorization is important because as we grow in our faith, what we've learned then can bring new, uh, new depth to our faith, to our prayer. So strongly encourage you to pray the Our Father with your children, to have them learn it, to memorize it. How do you do that? Well, I just think when I was growing up, we learned our prayers by praying them. My parents prayed them with us every night. When my sister was getting ready for first reconciliation and had to learn the, um, the act of contrition, now the whole family, every night, we were praying the act of contrition until we had it memorized. And then we kept praying. Um, and that's how I learned it a year before I needed to because my sister's older than me. So I encourage you really to, to, to take that time to, to, to pray together as a family and to, to learn these things. Okay, so our Father. What's the depth of this? First, our. It's not just, Jesus doesn't teach us to say my father. He teaches us to pray our father. You see, we're family. We're family. Adam, how does he always start? He's, oh, family, oh, family. He loves you guys because you're his family. And this isn't just nice words. By our baptism, we share blood, the blood of Christ. That's Christ's blood flowing through our veins. We're family, and we work together. It's not just me and God. It's us together as community of the church, the body of Christ, entering into relationship with God. Nowhere in the Bible is it about me and God. Everywhere it's about the church, the community of Israel, the, the, the people of God, together entering into relationship. And that's why it's so important to, to get to the sacraments, especially Mass. Now, I, I get it right now with the pandemic and everything. We, we have limited space. We're also struggling in terms of making sure we don't get sick and all that stuff. But in normal circumstances, we need to get to Mass, not just because it's an obligation, but because we're community. It's how we together grow closer to each other and closer to Almighty God, together. Our Father. Jesus teaches us to call God Abba, Daddy. Father engenders trust. That's what Adam and Eve lost in the garden. They lost their trust in God, right? And so we're called by Jesus. We're taught to call God Daddy, Abba, Father, and to have this intimate relationship with him. I think about Dr. Scott Hahn, who's uh, an evangelist and apologist. He talks about um, how he was preparing to do a, a debate with uh, a uh, a more, uh, not a Mormon, a Muslim. And as before the debate, they got together so they could talk about, you know, what are the ground rules? How are we going to deal with this? What all that stuff? And so they were talking and he kept talking about God as father. And the Muslim uh, kept saying, kept saying, stop blaspheming, stop blaspheming. And he said, well, they had to explain it and talk a little bit about it. He's like, well, what do you mean? Because for us, to understand God as Father is so central and key. But for him as a Muslim, and I don't know if this is from all Muslims or just for this particular Muslim, um, but it was to, to, to speak about God as Father was wrong. He is Lord, he is God, he is Master, but he's not Father. And, and for us, this is the greatest revelation of who God is. He's our daddy. He doesn't just care for you as a caregiver. He cares for you as a daddy. Okay. Our Father, who art in heaven. Heaven is where God is. Period. It's a, a lot of times, you know, we think about heaven being up there. 
but you know we can't just keep looking up to the sky and think well god is somewhere physically up there heaven is where god is and yes we look up there's a beautiful song called look up child um look it up on youtube look up child but um we do look up because there's something in us that says there's something greater than me there's some ground of being which is greater than me we look to but heaven isn't just up there somewhere heaven is wherever god is period and our hope for heaven is to be in intimacy with god back when i was in seminary uh some of the seminarians and i went to go see a movie in the movie theater with robin williams called uh, what dreams may come i'm not sure if you've ever seen it it's an okay enough movie but don't look to it for theology there was this one scene where um robin williams character is having trying to figure out heaven and everything and so someone is explaining it to him and so robin williams says well where is god in all this because in his heaven, he's just making everything whatever he wants it to be. Where is God in all of this? And the answer is, is, well, he's up there somewhere, shouting down that he loves us, wondering why we can't hear him. No, no, that's where we are right now on this earth. Heaven is intimacy with God. That we're with God. We're finally able to see his face and hear his voice and become one with him, not just in sign, but in reality. And so here we, we look and we say, God, who art in heaven, wherever you are, God, there is heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Now, hallowed is a big ancient word for holy. Holy is your name. Or another way of saying this is, may your name be sanctified. May your name be made holy. And it's interesting to note that the, the thy in this, hallowed be thy name, in the original Greek is actually in the second person singular. So I think about this because I took Spanish. In Spanish, um, you have for you, speaking about you, it's tu and usted. And this is not usted. This is tu. This is the personal, the intimate you. We get to talk to the God of the universe as an intimate friend, as Abba, as Daddy, as Tu. And here we look at the name of God. Hallowed be thy name. In ancient cultures, to know the name of someone was to know the person and to know them well. So this isn't just like, you know, saying, hi, I'm Father Vaughn. Hi, I'm Adam. You know, hi, Adam. Um, but rather, this is to know we didn't, they didn't just spit out their names to other people. A name, to know a person's name, was to know them. And so to know the name of God is to know him. Now, in the ancient times, when we look at the sacred scriptures, God reveals himself in so many different ways with different names. Uh, to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, he reveals himself as God, as God Almighty, as God Most High, as God of hosts or God of armies. We, we see the power and the authority of God. And then Moses has a new revelation of Almighty God, where God says, you know, in, in past times, I never revealed to them my true name. I said I was Almighty, I was Most High, but I revealed now myself as Yahweh, as I am who am, as being itself. And so he revealed, Jesus revealed, or rather God the Father, reveals himself as being itself. So he's not just Lord and God and Almighty, but he is being itself. He's the ground of all we are. But then Jesus comes and reveals to us the highest revelation of who God is. He is Father. From all eternity, he is Father. These are big words here. Begetting the Son. And for all eternity, the Son is begotten and sharing his love back with the Father. And for all eternity, the Holy Spirit is that love between them. So real, he's a person. So at the very heart of who God is, not just being itself, but relationship. And his relationship is Father. Hallowed be thy name. 
And this is so important because in our culture today, we take God's name in vain. We use it as a swear. His name is meant to be holy in us. Thy kingdom come. May your kingdom come, Lord. We're asking for his reign, his authority, his power, his, his glory. We're saying he is my king. He has authority over the whole universe. But then we look and we say, the truth is not all hearts long for him. Not all hearts give him obeisance. Not all hearts give him the authority that is his by nature. And so this, when we pray, thy kingdom come, looking at his authority, we can then look inside our own selves and say, do I long for him? Do I long for his glory here? Do I long for his kingdom? Do I long for him to be in authority in my life here and now? And it, it, it becomes a prayer as we say, thy kingdom come. And we just kind of skip over it so quickly, but thy kingdom come, it becomes a prayer where we say, Father, uproot anything within me that is not of your kingdom. And so often there are things within us that don't coincide, that don't go along with God's kingdom. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In this we, we recognize God's will is central. It's interesting when you look at the Greek and the way the words are used. It's not just, I, I always kind of thought it was, you know, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That, you know, Lord, help me to do your will because I want to be able to, to do this. I want to be able to conform my will to yours. But it's more, it's recognizing God is the one who is initiating. God is the one who is transforming. That our role, rather, is not just to say, okay, you know, I want to do my God's will in my life. But rather, we are to go and pound on the doors of heaven saying, God, bring your grace into our world. Bring your grace into this earth so that your will may be done here so perfectly as it is so perfectly done in heaven. That we're called to cry out to God saying, come Lord Jesus, come Father, come move here in this world. It's not just about us initiating, but rather it's God who is initiating and we're asking God initiate here in this world. Okay, am I like talking and just being over the top? Sometimes I am. I get excited about this stuff because it's about intimacy with God. It's about relationship with him. Now we move into the second part of the prayer. So this is all kind of the first part of the Our Father. Now we move into the second part. Give us this day our daily bread. Or another way of translating it is, give us the bread we need in order to go on living today. Give us the bread we need to go on living today. Uh, in the Greek, it's super substantial bread, asking, give us this day our super substantial bread, the bread we need to go on living for our substance in this day. And so we've got a twofold looking at this. One is it's an act of trust in God. And that's hard because it means we have to acknowledge how weak we are. We can't go on and get what we need. We need God. I need to confess my hunger for God. As I was saying, just after the Our Father, Jesus goes into this beautiful talk about how much we're called to trust God, where he says, you know, you can't serve two masters. You can, you'll either serve, love one and hate the other, be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon, God and stuff. He says, look at the lilies of the field. God clothes, clothes them. And they're thrown into the oven to, tomorrow. Look at the birds of the air. God feeds them. Are you not worth more than many sparrows, he says. Don't you know God is taking care of you? So don't, don't worry about what am I to eat or what am I to drink or what am I to wear. Your Father in heaven knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all these things will be given be to you besides. And he says, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't be anxious about tomorrow. Today has enough worries of its own. And so he's saying, we have to recognize our weakness. 
and that we can trust God. Again, it's back to that whole trust in God. So that's that's the things I need for this body for here and now today, but it's also super substantial bread. The day I the bread I need for today and tomorrow. Tomorrow being eternity. Asking for the Eucharist. That's what a lot of the fathers of the church believed when they when they read this. They understood this to be talking about the Eucharist. Asking for that super substantial bread, saying, God, give me your very self your life in the Eucharist. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So the first part of this, recognizing that forgiveness is real. Forgive us our trespasses. But the problem is a lot of times we don't really understand what forgiveness is. A lot of times we think about Forgiveness as being excused. That God excuses us. We're asking God to excuse us for the things we do. The problem with that is if God is excusing us, it's like he's saying, well, you weren't really to blame. Or there were all these circumstances or all these other things going on. And the problem is when we have a hard time forgiving ourselves because we know there were no mitigating circumstances. In in some cases, I mean, there are, there are times when there are mur- mitigating circumstances, other times when there, we, there are excuses. But for the real part of the sin, where there really is no excuse, because we knew better, we knew what it was, we knew how it was going to hurt this person, and we said it anyways, we did it anyways. We've done it maliciously, we've done it even with... Um, uh, uh, intent and, and over and over and over again habitually where there seems to be no excuse because there is no excuse that's where forgiveness is real that is where God's forgiveness enters and not where there is an excuse but where the, in the things that are completely inexcusable that's where God's forgiveness is real where we invite him really to forgive us, where we had all the blame in the world. It's a difference between forgiving and excusing. And and a lot of times there are excuses that go along with it, but it's after the excuses are all washed away and there's still that part that has no excuse for it, that we know is wrong. God forgives that. Yes, and this is what forgiveness is, where God says to us, yes, you have done this thing, and there's no excuse for it, but I accept your apology, and I will never hold it against you, and everything between us will be exactly the same as it was before. This is what God does. He forgives even the inexcusable. I have to keep reminding myself of that because I have a hard time forgiving myself at times because I know it's inexcusable, but that's what God's forgiveness is. But then we get to the second part of this prayer. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. This is the absolute condition for forgiveness is that we forgive. And in fact, as I read at the very beginning, as we were reading through the sacred scripture, Jesus then emphasizes it after, you know, deliver us from evil. He then emphasizes again, if you do not forgive sins of others, you will not be forgiven. This is the absolute condition for forgiving, is for, for receiving forgiveness is to forgive. Not just forgive if if the sin is not too frightful. Not just to forgive if there are excuses and extenuating circumstances. Not just to forgive the people that we love, but to forgive all, all of the sins, the inexcusable sins, 
the sins that keep are, are, are continuing to be done over and over to us, no matter how spiteful, no matter how mean, no matter how often they're repeated, the, the sins that are inexcusable, Jesus says, we have to forgive even those sins. We have to forgive, not just excusing, but forgive. And that's the difference, that we're not just saying oh, that they, they didn't really do anything. We're saying they really did something, but I'm still choosing to forgive. Now, it doesn't mean that we put ourselves in the, in the way of danger. So if we're in an abusive relationship with someone, it doesn't mean that we keep just becoming a doormat. That's not what I'm talking about. But it means we, within ourselves, kill every resentment, every wish for, for revenge, every wish to hurt or humiliate the other person who's hurt and humiliating us. That we're to kill every resentment for that other person that's in our hearts. That's hard. And so when I look at this prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It becomes a cry of the heart even to say, Lord, I need your help to forgive. Because I know I'm imperfect at forgiving. I need your help. And lead us not into temptation. Or in another way, subject us not to the test. Now, this is really looking at the test that is uh, a trial that tests our fidelity and lays bare, this is important, lays bare the true love of our hearts. This is the type of thing where we look and say, you know, when I'm tempted, what I really love. We say we love God, but until all these other things come up, until I have this choice between God and something else. And we realize I don't love God as much as I think I love him. And I realize that I'm not a hero. I can't be a hero. Only Jesus is. And it's, it's having to come face to face. Lead us not into temptation. It's about having to come face to face with our own weakness, my own weakness, and my complete dependence on God. This is hard stuff. This is deep stuff. I'm glad that Adam's recording this so that you can then go back and watch this again because there's kind of a lot of stuff going on here. But we're called, we're crying out to God as daddy saying, help me, daddy. Help me, daddy, not to go where I can't go. You know, when, when we pray the rosary, the first glorious mystery is the resurrection of our Lord. And I've taken that not just as I pray through it for myself, not just for that moment when Jesus was resurrected or the disciples as they're just seeing the empty tomb, but I see all the resurrection stories. And specifically, I almost always go to that point where Jesus after being raised from the dead, he then and goes and makes breakfast for the disciples who've been out fishing. And then he takes Peter and he says to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these, more than fishing, more than these things of the world? And I look at that and as I'm praying through this, it's always that conviction. Lord, so often I love these things more than I love you. But I want to love you more. Lead me not to that point where I have to make the choice between you and the things of this world, Lord, but help me just to love you first. But deliver us from evil or deliver us from the evil one. And in this, we're asking God not to abandon us from the merci in the hands of the merciless devil, but to keep us in his mercy. So, with all this, we look and we say, God is, um, is inviting us into a relationship with him. He's saying, you know, call God Father. One of the prayers that's been very, very helpful and very deep within my life is uh, a prayer where I just pray, Abba, I belong to you over and over and over again. Abba, I belong to you. And I breathe, breathe in, Abba, breathe out, I belong to you. And as I pray that over and over and over again, it transforms my understanding of who God is. I see, wait, he's not just 
out there. He's not even just father as the one who is, wait till your father gets home. But he is the Abba, the daddy who plays with me, who loves me, who holds me, who protects me. Abba, I belong to you. It becomes not I belong to sin, not I belong to my own brokenness, my weakness. I belong to you. So I invite you to go deep into this prayer, the Our Father. And one of the ways that we can go beyond the uh, just saying the Our Father is to do it a little bit differently. And one of the things I like to do is to pray the Our Father backwards. It doesn't mean I go like this. But it means as we pray the Our Father backwards, you take each of those parts and pray it from the backwards forward. Uh, that way we truly enter into that mystery. So I'm going to do this right now with us. So I invite you just to enter into prayer with me. And I'll just slowly pray through each of these. And so we've got the vocal prayer, the meditation, the contemplation. Um, and so maybe just gaze on each of these things or think, what does this mean for me in the meditation as I pray this? But deliver us from evil. And lead us not into temptation. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Give us this day our daily bread. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come. Hallowed be thy name. Who art in heaven. And this is what I love so much about this prayer. Doing it backwards is that we end in the arms of our Father. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Adam? All right. Thank you so much, Father. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And I love that, you know, he, he started with the importance of memorization. Because if, when we memorize, when we're growing, when we're, when we're you know, coming through the initiation stage of our faith, we keep looking back at this prayer and we keep remembering and we keep reflecting upon the depth of each and every line. So, you know, at first you may have thought, oh, we're talking about the Our Father. I learned that years ago. Did we really? You know, did we really? So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.